It's your boy Crypto Blood, and welcome to another kick in this session. And today, I've got the legendary Matoshi Komodo. I mean, Max Kaiser. What's going on, Max? How you doing? Hey, Crypto Blood. Good to see you, man. You Great too. to be on finally. You know, it's yeah. been my dream to finally get on Crypto Blood. Oh my and God. So Stop. this is all happening for me. Stop. <laughs> Fantastic. So I've got uh, Satoshi Nakamoto here, guys, uh, live and direct. Uh, what, what's going on, man? I haven't seen you since, like, uh, what was it, Florida? Uh, we were in Miami last year. I saw you and Stacy. What have you been up to, man? Like, what are, you, what are your projects you're doing now? What initiatives are you pushing? I know you, you're doing something with Stacy. A new uh, like segment, right? You, you guys doing a new show? Yeah, well, we have a new series that we uh, we shot called Gonzo, Max and Stacy. So we travel across the country. It's airing on RT. It's a whole separate show. Oh, sweet. I think they're, sweet. Yeah, they've aired uh, five or six episodes. Of what days? Episodes. What days does it come on the actual RT channel? It uh, comes on Sundays. Okay, what time? And we're in. Uh, we're shooting now in another new series called To the Moon. It's a ten-part series about the history of Bitcoin, and it uses a lot of archival footage from Kaiser Report because you know we started covering Bitcoin back in 2011. Exactly. And so we had a lot of people on the show who are top people in crypto, and we interviewed them for the first time. And so they, uh, we you know, this part of the series called To the Moon. Sweet, sweet. So that's coming along great, man. That's that's awesome. Um, you know, I think I've never asked you this, and maybe you've mentioned it. I just never picked up on it. Like, who got you into actually knowing about Bitcoin and, and getting interested in it and, and you know, getting your feet wet with the whole technology? Like, who got you introduced to it? Unless you are Satoshi and you, you're just introducing all of us to it. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> well, I heard about it for the first time in 2011 when we booked a guest on the Kaiser Report named John Matonis. Okay. And uh, he came on and told us about Bitcoin. And he had come from the encryption side of the business over there at Hushmail. Uh, very okay. quickly, we got an invitation to go to the first Bitcoin conference in Prague in 2011. And that was paid for actually by Tony Gallippi at BitPay, mm -hmm. who uh, sent us our first Bitcoin and paid for our trip to Prague to be at the conference. And we ended up being venture capital investors in BitPay. Nice. And uh, one thing that we've been doing really since 2011 has been making investments in, this, in these companies. So we have investments in Kraken, Bitfinex, Shapeshift, BitPay, and uh, BitPesa in, in Kenya. I would say that our venture capital business is probably the best performing venture capital fund in crypto because we avoided all ICOs. Kraken is now doing a fundraising round at four billion. I think we got in yep, at a valuation heard about around that. five million. You know, it's a hundred X uh, mover, and uh, the exchange business is booming. Anyway, so when John Matonis came on the show uh, and told us about Bitcoin, it played into Already, my experience in Los Angeles, I created the Hollywood Stock Exchange yep. and I invented the uh, virtual specialist technology. So it's the first patented virtual currency, patent number 5950176, I believe. So it's the first patented virtual currency. And I was um, kind of primed to hear about this cryptocurrency. And so we immediately jumped into it. That's dope, man. I, I, I'm like, I can't believe I've been watching you since probably 2011, 10. I don't know why I had not ever heard you mention Bitcoin on there. I wish I would have, uh, but I didn't hear about it until uh, 2013, early 13. But um, good for you, man. I'm glad you guys are making moves in that uh, industry as far as, you know, like venture capitalists. Yeah, we uh, the fund is uh, doing well. We uh, made our investment last year in Casa, mm -hmm. Casa Hodl, which is uh, came to us through our friendship with Jameson Lop. Yep. And uh, now they uh, met up with uh, Jeremy, uh, the CEO at uh, Satoshi Roundtable, and uh, they are doing extremely well. And um, so, do you think? Do you think like this is going to be the trend now? Uh, as as the 
as the crypto industry matures with Kraken looking to go IPO, is that going to be the trend? Do you think that's going to start happening more and more with these private companies? I know as an investor, you hope to, that's well, like I the mean, ultimate goal, right? So to, all, to go all, public. All events, I mean, the venture, of course, you know, you want an exit strategy. It either gets bought out, like, okay, we own shares in Bitstamp, right. and they were acquired. They were bought yeah. out. So that was the exit. Uh, so then you want either to be acquired, acquired or right. to be an IPO, or in the case of Bitfinex, they've paid out a couple of very, very, very nice dividends. So the dividends on Bitfinex have already exceeded our basis on that investment so that's already in the black and you know um, speaking of Bit bitfinex and, I, and this is not even on the outline there's so much fud around bitfinex why do you think that is like it's, it's been like this for years like they always say they're insolvent you know with the whole tether thing and what are your thoughts about why the the community perceives bitfinex the way they do well uh, the community perceives everything with fun right there's nothing in the in bitcoin that's not that doesn't have a huge negative um kind of uh you know back, uh, the cheer you know people in the background screaming complaining but is, is that a sign of, of of immaturity in this in this market in this community because you don't see that like in in equities you know, you don't see the the level of fud and, and emotional tone how how you do with with cryptos. Yeah, I think it is a matter of immaturity because you have um, really technology technologists coming into the money market and and uh, currency business, and this is completely new for them. Mm -hmm. This is the first time they've had really open source money or you know uh, tech tech technologically, you know, uh, engendered money and as mm -hmm. such. So it, you bring in a completely different um, category of folks who have absolutely no experience with markets, finance, equities, n absolutely nothing. So it's they're, right. they're, they're learning from the beginning. And so they're going through a whole process of uh, maturation. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to see... Um, kind of uh, some maturity in the space. And to get back to Bitfinex, I think it does relate back to Tether. And there's a lot of questions about whether Tether was backed up by actual money. And uh, we had, there was a big discussion on this um, two years ago. And um, th there was a conference call, Tether's, you know, outlined the, the, how, the, how they were backed up by money in the bank. And that sense been corroborated by a couple of different sources. And so I don't see any problem with that. Uh, they, they have uh, the collateral for Tether. And, uh, but to get back to the FUD question, um, also people tend to talk down projects that they, they're trying to either manipulate the price down or manipulate the price up. Sure. And you have social media is, is a great echo chamber for that. Mm -hmm. And you, you do have it in equities. I mean, you do have it in, in, in the big leagues, uh, you know, you'll see major money managers like uh, Carl Icahn will come out and FUD the, uh, the, the, the hedge fund guy who was recently in Herbal Life. Um, there was a huge, uh, major multi-billion dollar FUD fight over the price of Herbal Life stock. Yeah. I think Carl Icahn eventually won that fight. But it's very similar to what you might see in the crypto business, but on a much, you know, multi-billion dollar scale. Right. So it's just human nature. And um, you have, um, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting market because you have this whole generation, millennial generation now that's, that's coming up through um, and it, it just this, this whole new paradigm of crypto, crypto money, cryptocurrency. Yeah, that whole I remember that whole uh, beef between uh, Icon and Bill Ackman. I think yeah. is, is who it is. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's true. Uh, speaking of Icon, I remember him saying, and and this kind of segues me into my next question about where we are today with cryptos. I remember Carl Icon saying not to confuse brains with bull markets, and we had a hell of a bull market in 2017. 
A lot of people were online, YouTube, traders overnight. They were just, you know, the geniuses of, of our world. They knew everything. Um, nothing could go down. But now, in, you know, we saw in 2018, that role reversed. And a lot of capital destruction occurred in 2018. And it's different. I think it's different this time. The, the crash this time is different than, let's say, the one we had right after Mt. Gox. Where there, you know, there was a percentage wise, they may have been the same, but this go around, we had a lot of money, a lot of capital invested in projects. And and what are your thoughts about the long term ramifications, if there are any, from this last bear market and it and, and it being different than priors? Well, you know, my experience goes back to uh, the 1987 stock market crash. Mm -hmm. So I started on Wall Street in 1983. And I was on Wall Street for seven years during the 80s. And you had the similar situation in the 1980s on Wall Street. It was predominantly 20-year-olds like myself. Mm -hmm. We became instantly wealthy. Mm -hmm. We developed a, incredible delusions of grandeur, <laughs> of, you know, the God complex, if you will. Right. And could do nothing wrong. You know, I can tell you <laughs> crazy stories from that time. Uh, then... I started a company in Los Angeles called the Hollywood Stock Exchange during the dot-com boom. And of course that crashed in 2001 and that, the NASDAQ dropped 85, 90%. It was a $5 trillion crash. Yeah. And right before that crash, you had a similar delusions of grandeur. I mean, the people who I hired, the 20 year olds that I hired, they were telling me the same stuff that I was telling myself back during the stock market run of the 1980s. And I knew that we were approaching the top and I actually sold out of a big position of my Hollywood Stock Exchange stock because I could see that this was going to crash because you said the conditions were the same. Then I had another experience with the silver market. You know, we started mm -hmm. buying silver at 15 and ran up to 50. There was an incredible euphoria at 50, then yeah. it crashed back to 15. And now uh, crypto, you know, we wrote it from essentially a market cap of 5 million to 840 billion. And it's had a, 600 billion dollar crash and but right before it crashed you had the same the, the same incredible delusions of grandeur the same god complex you know people felt they were bulletproof mm -hmm. they could do no wrong and just the kind of insanity you see at market tops was evident and now you kind of have the opposite where in the last six months people are sick of it you know you mentioned crypto and they they throw up, you know, it makes them vomit. It's horrible. It's, you know, it's, it's just it's no uh, longer the buzzword in the room, right? Like in, in, in 17, you mentioned crypto. Everyone's like coming over to you. Like, uh, should I get into it? And you know, how long have you been in it? And all that, you know what I'm saying? Like now people don't even want to mention crypto when they walk in the room, you know, just, yeah, well, just, that's why, that's why our fund Heisenberg capital, I think has done really well because we had, we didn't do anything in 2017. We nice. just, we nice. just stepped out of the out of the arena and said, you know, let this thing, you know, play out. It's 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 gone well past the irrational exuberance. It's in the stratosphere somewhere. And now uh, here we are, thirty uh, thirty five hundred or something of that, something like that. And so we're seeing bargains again. Mm -hmm. So on the on the fun side, we're seeing we're we're talking to companies again. We're we're lining up equity investments now, and we Things see on the dollar um, probably right. We're talking to uh, a few companies. I think I've mentioned on uh, Twitter, for example, we're talking to Azteca, mm -hmm. um, a company that does Bitcoin vouchers. We think we like that very much. Um, you know, there's three or four other companies we're t actively talking to. And so we're kind of getting back in now when when the, uh, you know, the hot money is gone. So now you know, right. the bargains are there and you can you can find some good some good deals now. No, that's that's cool. What do you so? What are your thoughts about you know you saying that the the, the market has kind of re, come back to earth, is repriced? What is fair value for Bitcoin? Like, do you think this is something we could ever achieve or know? I should say, the fair no, value of think, Bitcoin. I don't. I don't think the economics really are completely. The the, the book of Bitcoin economics has not been written. Yeah. I think Saint Dean Amus's book, The Bitcoin Standard, is the best book written so far about the economics of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the model here is different than anything else. It's you know, you, you could say it's similar to gold mining, but 
you know, in gold mining, you don't have the, the steady emission schedule every 10 minutes, right? Um, which you have in Bitcoin. And that that is unique in economics. And it, so the model, no one's really been able to, I think, distill the essence of it. I think it is a new economic model completely. It's different, it's different than anything we've seen before. And the old line economists like Noriel Rubini and Paul Krugman, they're completely off oh base. They have no idea what they're talking about. They're completely <laughs> wrong. You have Satina Moose with the Bitcoin standard gives a great historical perspective. And I think he does the, the best job so far in making the case of Bitcoin as gold or gold 2.0. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I know. But, I remember when I first got into crypto, um, back then you know it was it we were still looking to have bitcoin be like a cash equivalent a digital cash version of fiat um a, a trustless decentralized version of it but as as i've just kind of gone through this whole experience of cryptocurrencies over the past six years man i am now to the point where i look at bitcoin as gold or in a, a, a digital asset. What are your thoughts? Is is Bitcoin cash or is Bitcoin gold? Right. So going back to 2011 and, you know, the first company to really be established in the space was BitPay and they positioned themselves as the PayPal of Bitcoin. Right. And everyone was really excited about payments and that you could compete with PayPal. And this was a great way to uh, go around all the legacy systems. And um, oh, after a few years, though, it became obvious that Bitcoin doesn't scale like uh, Visa or MasterCard. And around 2016 is when this idea came, came, came into fruition in a big way that actually the way to look at Bitcoin would be as a store of value. Right. Uh, and then from there, if it, if it, like the history of gold, you know, gold was first a collectible and then it became a store of value. Then it became a medium of exchange and it became a unit of account. So Bitcoin on that curve is really still in between collectible and store of value. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's getting to the point now where it will be considered a medium of exchange or unit of account. So that's happening uh, with let's say Abra, I don't know if you follow the story from Abra, the the, the wallet yeah. company. They've introduced a new Bitcoin-backed way to buy stocks and bonds and ETFs and commodities all over the world, and they use Bitcoin in the on the back end as the unit of account. So users are not even aware that they're buying and selling Bitcoin. So it, because that's for them, they're buying Apple stock, but the mm -hmm. Apple stock is actually goes through a layer, a Bitcoin layer. And it's all accounted for and hedged and managed through the Bitcoin smart contracts on the back end. And so that's now Bitcoin as unit of account. So I talked to Bill Barheit about this, and he makes an interesting point to your point about is it a medium of exchange? Is it store of value? It, his belief, and I can see where, where he's coming from, is that the demand for Bitcoin, which we all thought would come from payments, you yeah, know, we wanted every merchant in the world to accept Bitcoin. Right. This was the goal, and this is where it's going to scale, and this is how the revolution is going to happen. But he he makes the point that Bitcoin as collateral mm. could be the the drive the adoption. So you uh, mean in a much bigger way? So you mean like having sovereign countries use it as a collateralized type of uh, asset? Well, in the case of Abra, they need Bitcoin as, for collateral to make for the platform. So right. they're a big buyer of Bitcoin and they're a big trader of Bitcoin. And so um, all similar types of platforms like BACT and others and financial institutions to create these uh, contracts and to create these markets, they need Bitcoin as collateral. They need Bitcoin in the bank. Yeah. So that could be the biggest, biggest demand from Bitcoin um, before we see it evolving into payment. What is the catalyst and for that? that transition what you're talking about is it the sovereign debt crisis that we we see bubbling up um or they've been covering over for the last 10 years that finally uh folding is that is that going to be the catalyst for for us to see bitcoin used in that manner well the catalyst as far as abra is concerned is that it's cheaper you know this gotcha. is the way they can offer all these services 
and the user for the first year anyway, they don't pay any fees. Mm -hmm. So because of the frictionless quality of Bitcoin and smart contracts and you can recreate and with this particular system, the KYC AML is not required. So think about this, um, you know, this kind of opens up another discussion about capitalism. Right. And in America at the moment, there's a lot of talk about we need to revisit capitalism. We need to tax billionaires. Oh, we need God. to adopt socialism and this type of thing. And I think what is missing and what needs to be understood about capitalism and why it's currently not really doing what it can do is that there's a lack of access. People, it's still very difficult for people to have access to these capital markets globally. Um, but with, some, with a product like Abra, you, there are a billion people now who can get on the Abra app and have access to all stocks, all bonds, all commodities, all right. Forex contracts in the world. And once you give people access to these things, and once they understand hard money and they understand savings and they understand capital formation, then, you know, they're good to go. They want to, they want economic individual sovereignty will always win out over being managed by a centralized authority like the state. Right. Uh, that's not a naturally occurring way to organize human beings. Human beings are naturally individually sovereign and they have a sense of individual worth. Uh, once you undercut that with what would broadly, very broadly, you could say would be called socialism, uh, you, you are disincentivizing a functioning society and economy. And we see that over and over again. There's no example really of a functioning uh, economy or state that is managed by a centralized authority. Uh, and in, in the biggest problem in the U.S. economy is the centralization of the banking system through the central bank. I mean, if you got rid of the central bank or opened the central bank up to genuine price discovery for money and interest rates, it would have a profound impact on the economy in a very positive way. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, that's on the demand side. So, but, but your question was really, will the demand be, will it, will it come from a flight to quality? And Correct. I think that since the introduction of the Genesis block in 2009, we have not had a global financial crisis like we had in 2008. That's you know, true. The, uh, the Genesis block came about after the global financial crisis and in response to the global financial cr crisis, but we haven't had uh, the next chapter yet. But it looks like in this year we will resume the global crisis, and this will, be, uh, this will now be the opportunity for there to be a flight to quality into Bitcoin. It'll give central banks a way to preserve their assets, uh, states, uh, sovereign wealth funds, high net worth individuals. There are more than, it's more than $100 trillion worth of investable assets around the world looking for returns. All the home offices around the world that manage hundreds of billions are always going to be looking for safe havens. So and, just imagine 10% uh, of that, Max, 10% of that just spill over to crypto or Bitcoin. I mean, right. and then, we're and then looking... You have the, the halving is coming up, I think, in yes. 15 months or something. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, the, the, fund, the fundamental values, the fundamentals are starting to kick in. The, the demand is still there. The technologies have been up uptime 99.99%. Right. You know, I just, what, what, uh, Wells Fargo Bank just went down from 48 hours. <laughs> yeah, I did a hours, video right? about that. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. So, um, I guess we can kind of roll into the whole Fed topic man we've got jerome powell he spoke today at some i forgot what event he spoke at today but uh we had the stock market rally and that probably rallied over what the trump administration is doing it looks like they may have a deal with the wall but what are your thoughts about jerome powell to me backtracking on his uh interest rate um, schedule hikes that you know that the Fed were looking to do in 2019. It looks like uh, he he bowed to Mr. Trump there. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, as we say in the Kaiser Report now for many years, you cannot 
taper a Ponzi scheme. Right. Right. The U.S. economy is a Ponzi scheme. And you need that fresh Ponzi money at the base of the pyramid. And once you, if you cut that off, the whole thing collapses. So anytime they raise rates, even by a quarter of a percentage point, stock market starts to collapse and they reverse themselves. What's interesting is that Powell said that, and this is new, that they are entertaining the idea of permanent quantitative easing. So there will be no end to quantitative easing. They're going to engage in permanent open market activity, permanent quantitative easing. There will never, ever be a point when this massive pretty, uh, money printing Ponzi scheme stops. And I so believe you Court. said that back in 2008 or nine on one of your shows. You said they will never be able to stop once they, once they, once they start. Well, it goes back all the way to Alan Greenspan. You know, he introduced this idea of the Greenspan put, put back yeah. in the uh, 1987. You know, as I said, I was a stockbroker during the 1987 crash. And the day after the crash, October 20th, 1987 was the beginning of what's now called the plunge protection team. So Robert Rubin, Ronald Reagan, and Alan Greenspan created the working group on finance in Washington, and they actively were buying S and P futures to, to jack the stock market higher. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning then of government buying stocks and, and getting rid of the price discovery in the markets. And anytime markets went down, it was very convenient for them to simply buy in the open market, print money and buy stocks. It, it got so absurd, crypto blood, that the Swiss National Bank actually prints money and buys Apple stock. Yeah, right? yeah, the, yeah. One of the yes, that's owners true. Owners of Apple stock. That is right? very true. Money that they print, right? So they they learned mm -hmm. that from the plunge protection team from 1987. <laughs> so now and then you got we, Japan we, doing the same. They've been doing that for, for years, intervening in their uh, equity markets as yeah, well. Yeah, ha half, the, half the equity market in Japan is owned by the central bank. Exactly. Or, or more, it's right? Same, so, man. Um, this, is, um, this is now on permanent. No, so this is going to be, I think, obviously, you see, gold is, for the first time in 50 years, central banks are buying gold aggressively. They bought over 640 tons last year. They're going to buy over 600 tons this year. Price of gold is starting to perk up. And uh, so this is great for Bitcoin and Bitcoin. Another, it's another fundamental reason why Bitcoin looks attractive. It's just so obvious. To see, if you just like plot when since 2009, eight, no, well, 2009, you plot the Federal Reserve looking to, you know, in QE1, the stock market pulls back. Then they do QE2. Then they in QE2, and then the stock market pulls back. It's, it's so evident that the stock market is only going up because of their easy mo monetary policy. And so it's like they say that they're not focused on the stock market, but it's so obvious that the Fed is only concerned with the stock market, right? That's the only metric they look at. You know, it makes sense because um, something like 50, per, yeah, 50% 50 of all the stocks in America are owned by 1% of the population. Yes, that's right. I think 85% of all the stocks are owned by the top 10% of the population. So that's their constituency. And, uh, you know, if they wanted to do something for the economy, they could have done, you know, Barack Obama could have, uh, instead of bailing out the creditors, he could have bailed out the debtors. He could have made whole. Could have helped mortgage. us millennials who have uh, uh, student loan debt as a mortgage. He could have helped us out. We he would have been have spending crazy if, if he would have helped us out. It would have been cheaper because yeah. they, they printed $17 trillion to bail out the bankers. And all they did was perpetuate the Ponzi scheme and made it worse. Had he bailed out you guys with student loans, mortgages, and credit card debt, you would have then been in a position to rebuild the economy with actual jobs and it would have been a more robust economy and it would not have been now in this precarious state that it that it's in now that this this next leg of this crisis this big drop is, is going to be catastrophic on many levels i mean you see de-globalization going on all over de-dollarization going on countries are no longer really interested in the globalized world trump has said look we want to pull out of the globalist the globalist game 
Uh, you have Brexit, where they're pulling out of the EU. With the remaining EU is splitting apart. Italy looks like it's falling apart. Uh, you have um, the U.S. The Saudi Arabia is pulling out of OPEC or re realigning OPEC. That whole uh, globalized institution is falling apart. Um, so th this is all a recipe for currency disaster, economic disaster, and um, the dollar at the moment is benefiting. But I think that ultimately, since it's not ha has zero, it, it, you know, it can't compete with gold. And increasingly, people will realize that it can't compete with Bitcoin either. So the dollar is uh, a bit of a roach motel. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But I don't think the dollar is just going to or any of these fiat currencies are just going to go poof, disappear overnight. You know, it's I think it's a it's already been a slow, gradual death, but I think it'll just continue to be a slow death. Where are your thoughts about that? Do you, do you see it just having us getting to a point where it's so bad it, it just all disappears and we move to a new system? Or do you see a gradual movement away from fiat currencies? Well, the, the average lifespan for paper money or fiat currency going back 300 years is 27 years. Mm -hmm. uh, none have ever survived. They've all gone to zero. The, the one that's kind of the longest standing one would be the British pound. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not backed by silver or gold as it once was. Of course, it's none, none of them are backed by anything tangible anymore. So, as of 1971 when the U.S. closed the gold window. So it's all fiat money referring to other fiat money. So I, I would say that the British pound is, you'd have to start the clock, you know, when they went off the metal standard, really. You can't really go back to the 1794 and the creation of the Bank of England. So, so you know, the fact that, is that they all go to zero. Not, not, yeah. None of them survive. They all go to zero. They all go to zero. Yeah, that's true. So uh, lastly, man, and this, this is kind of going along with the whole sovereign thing. You know, Venezuela, man, this is this is the epicenter of what, what we can now today are uh, Zimbabwe moment. Right. Where we've got the hyperinflation going on with them. Uh, Maduro is looking. They're, they're trying to get him out of there. And I thought about it. You know, Maduro has this petrol crypto thing initiative. He's been you know, trying to build the last uh, year or so, uh, the United States put sanctions on them, told, you know, United St citizens of America, you cannot use this petrol crypto. If you do, it's going to be, you're going to be having some real issues. Do you think that the ousting of Maduro might be partially because of his defiance and, and his uh, initiative to start his own petrol crypto? Well, any country that's moved away from the dollar and pricing their energy has been bombed. Uh, you know, Gaddafi in Libya, he wanted to start trading energy outside of the dollar. He was taken out. Saddam Hussein similarly taken out. Um, you, you have this uh, pattern where the U.S. dollar, you know, empire can't abide by having anyone trading in energy or anything else in something other than the dollar. And in the case of Venezuela, you know, they um, are not going to get much traction with the Petro. It's not really a robust cryptocurrency. It's a kind of a, I, it would, I think it sets the stage for some other country to go on 100% Bitcoin. You know, there's 100 central banks in the world. One of them will wise up and figure out that if we convert our reserves to Bitcoin, we're going to become the only hard money central bank in the world right. and attract a lot of capital. Uh, you know, Venezuela is, uh, uh, it's an interesting situation because the U.S. is obviously engaged in, in other countries in a coup, and they're yeah. meddling in that country's affairs, right. um, and there's, it's, it's not debatable, it's unequivocally true. Uh, at the same time, and people will say that's great, and we should med be meddling in their affairs, and that's the main line, mainstream media's line, and you see that all the time in mainstream America. At the same time, these folks will say that Russia, in, you know, meddled in the U.S. elections in 2016, even though there's no evidence for that or proof for that. Um, but but uh, somehow, um, that's not on the same scale as the U.S. meddling in these other countries. You know, it's, it's hypocritical to the extreme, and it's just playing out in real time. How can that not be hypocritical? 
uh, you know, it's it's just amazing that the blindness that you see in mainstream uh, media about these issues. It really is. So uh, final thoughts, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, what are your final thoughts about crypto 2019 and beyond? Like, um, I want to have you back on to discuss STOs. I think that's going to be huge where in the future you see, you know, a lot of companies not going to Wall Street to, to uh, go public, but going to the blockchain. So we'll have to talk about that in the future. But what are your final thoughts for 2019 and beyond? For crypto i think that you know yeah i mean thanks for having me on but uh, you know the fundamentals are very strong and uh so i think this is i think we're starting to see the 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 adoption rates i've always thought have been driven by crisis and the crisis outside of crypto is now bigger than the crisis inside of crypto mm-hmm. you know the the the, the algorithm the, the protocol is ingenious because it it managed to force out the bad actors like Jihan Wu and others, and it killed them. You know, it forced them out mm-hmm. through its own internal game theory mechanisms. And now it's uh, it's it's the timing of this next bull market, this next phase is right in there with the the, the collapse of some of these other banks and and, and currencies. So it, it's all working out perfectly to plan crypto blood. It's all happening exactly as Satoshi envisioned it. We're right on schedule. We're exactly where we should be. That's great, man. We millennials need it more than anybody. I'm telling you, we're struggling over here, man. It's your boy Crypto Blood. And that's another kicking it session with the legendary Max Kaiser. We out of here, people. How?